Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Studio Me cast. I'm your host, quite obviously, and today I have another very special guest, Salil, who I met at the Cannes Film Festival. Salil is a composer, and we're going to get all into the kinds of stuff that he's done and he does. Just a quick thing, though, some of his projects have been involved with uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime and Emmy nominated and stuff like that. So we can get into the details later, or you can check the link in the description below to go over to his website and listen to some of his music. But rather than extending the intro, please join me in welcoming Salil. Salil, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me to your podcast. Absolutely. So we met at Cannes. And it was very late at night at one of the many cafes there. Um, what were you doing at Cannes in the first place? So I have a business, Sound and Music. So I am a composer. I have teammates who do sound and music also. And our studio is called Cam Studio. And as a business, I thought, uh, given how we have been building our portfolio and the kinds of things that we have been doing in terms of making music and sound for films. I thought it might be a nice time to go abroad, especially to Cannes because it has one of the biggest film markets, probably the biggest film market, and try to see what kind of, what the film scene looks like in Europe and uh, across the world and see how my cam, my, my studio, Cam Studio fits into all of that and just making new connections and meeting filmmakers and people like yourself, creatives. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was the whole thing. Well, that's fantastic. So you're based in LA, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that your first time at the Cannes Film Festival? Yes, it was. I was initially planning on going in 2020, but uh, everything was uh, canceled. Basically I was, uh, I was trying to go to Tribeca South by Southwest uh, game, uh, the game, the, the game conference, I forget the name, uh, but the, the, the one that happens in San Francisco, everything was online or canceled. So, uh, it happened this year, which is good. Now you've had, uh, you've been involved with a project that showed at South by Southwest film festival. Is that correct? Yeah, it was back in 2017. That's right. I guess I'll try to start a little bit more toward the beginning. Mm -hmm. You already have so many projects that are on these platforms that are so accessible to people You've had your work featured in festivals that are you know household names to people who you know are into film festivals and stuff like that um so how did you like did you initially want to get into film and uh video game scores or did you have a love for music before that so that's that's a great question. I mean, uh, I have been learning music ever since I was little, and since I grew up in India, and my grandfather is a musician. He was the one who started teaching me. I learned Indian classical music as a vocalist for the longest time, and then discovered my love for composition at in my teen years. And at some point, I came across this whole scoring for movies. Uh, by having to score a small clip for some obscure competition. And that was the first time I was like, oh, I could, this is this is very interesting. It was a wildlife clip. And I was learning piano at that time. So my piano tutor sort of, he, he was, he's also a producer so, and a composer. So he, he kind of taught me a little bit about how to write music to film using a software. And that was really fascinating. That sort of changed, um, that made me change gears in a way and think about film composition the way I hadn't before. And I got more and more interested in learning Western music and started looking at uh, universities where I could learn music composition, Western composition. And Berkeley College of Music was one of the names that came up when I tried to look for film scoring as such. And that's when I was like, this is the school to go to. and it it had everything. The film scoring program looked like everything that I wanted to do. And ever since then, it, it's been very focused effort in terms of learning how to score for film, media, video games. Uh, and I continue to do that. And that passion has sort of never died. Your music, when I was listening to it on your website, once again, everybody, link in the description below, instantly 
you're able to establish a tone, like set an atmosphere, uh, which is absolutely, I would think, you know, is vital to the different mediums that you work in. When you're approaching tone in music, is there a difference between doing that when you're um, working with a film versus just music that stands on its own? Right. That, that's a great question. And the one that I've thought about myself, because I have been writing music for film for such a long time. And uh, it's, it's been a while since I wrote a piece of music just as a piece of music. And it would be interesting to see how that goes. But for me, film is such a huge inspiration for me when I write. So when I look at film and uh, start working on the first scene that needs music, it really inspires me. The tone of the film really inspires me to write music in a way that is right for the film. So... I'm sure it's very different. So I, I, I have to see uh, by writing something that's not particularly for film and see how how that's different. But for me, when I think about just music, I feel kind of like, would I do I know how to write music? Or is it just because I have a film in front of me that I sort of inspiration comes and I uh, it's a collaborative effort and that is that is that the reason why I'm able to write music at all. So that's a, that's a question that always, and people ask me, what, what was your inspiration? Like what inspires you? How do you get motivated to write? And then I'm like, it's the film, really. The filmmaker, it's a collaborative process. You talk to the filmmaker and things like that. And uh, that's that's my starting point. So it's never a blank canvas, so to say. Do you ever find it difficult to decide on a tone when you're, looking at a film that you might be working on like if it might not be very apparent that this is a psychological thriller or a horror or an adventure like do you ever have a, an issue figuring out exactly what the sound should be for any given scene yeah that that definitely happens but uh, again it, it gives me comfort that I'm not alone in the whole process because there's a lot of communication with the filmmaker and uh, I initially, when I started, I was very fresh uh, at this whole thing. At that time, it used to be different because I would go off to the film and then just listen little and be excited to put my voice in more than anything. And then, of course, it used to happen a lot where the filmmaker would be like, and of course, I, I would write a piece of music and it would be, I would be very excited about it. I would think that I've just created a masterpiece and I've just made the film so darn amazing. And then the filmmaker would be like, ah, uh, that's great, but uh, not what we're looking for. Let's let's try something else. And I would be furious. Like, what do you mean? I, I know what I'm doing. This is great <laughs> and all that. And then eventually, uh, the more I scored, the more I collaborated, I realized that this is not my project to just take and run into the closet and just write some piece of music for. It's constant collaboration. So now I talk a lot to filmmakers, what their inspiration is, what what's the story that they are trying to tell, uh, what tone they are looking to have for, for a scene. And so it usually, the the way I solve the problem of the difficulty of how do I solve this? It's, it's always uh, communication with the filmmaker. It's very easy when working with a client to sort of run away with your own creativity because in a way that's what they've hired you to do. But sometimes what you come up with that, find, that you find artistic fulfillment in uh, and might even technically be better uh, in <laughs> some ways, <laughs> might not be, like you said, what they're going for. However, have you ever had a time when you came up with something completely different than what the filmmaker initially wanted? It, maybe it, it wasn't like a intentional on your part, like maybe they didn't communicate that well, and then later you find out, uh, this isn't exactly what I wanted, but it won them over anyway? Like, oh, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, let's go with that direction. Does that ever happen? Yeah, it definitely does. And uh, 
it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens sometimes. And it's, it's really cool to hear a filmmaker say that, oh, this is not what I had envisioned, but this is working great. And uh, that's also a part of collaboration that's really rewarding where uh, you come up with something. And uh, conversely, uh, you know, as I said, I make something, I create something that I'm super happy with and I'm excited about. And the filmmaker, you know, shoots it down for good reasons. And then they're like, oh, this is not it. Let's try this. I'm like, ah, oh, this, I mean, this, I don't know. And then of course it used to be much more, I used to be much more resistant to that. Now, of course it's, I'm very open to, and as you have to be as a film composer or any part of the crew uh, to be collaborative. So when the filmmaker comes and says something different, I'm like, okay, let's try that. And then oftentimes I'm pleasantly surprised at how, beautiful that other thing is that they are trying to and I'm like oh wow this is different and I, I didn't I, I wouldn't have approached it this way but now that I have I see what they were going for backing up just a little bit are you usually brought in after the rest of the film is essentially completed that's from what I understand that's normally how it works the film's pretty much done or completely done except for music there are cases where someone might go to a composer before they even film. They'll just hand them a script and say, hey, come up with stuff for this. Um, what's been your experience on when you get into a project? What what time in the – at what point in its completion do you get brought in? So 99% of the times, it's as you mentioned, it's, it's in the post when the film is done and the – cut is technically logged obviously there is no such thing as a log cut anymore because you can keep changing things but yeah when it's relatively locked uh in place is when i'm brought in and there are, there have been like one or two cases where the filmmakers were uh, as filmmakers asked me to come up with themes and ideas beforehand which is also cool i like that uh reading the script uh, getting the feel for the story and then coming up with something without looking at the film at all, but just off of the story. That's also something that I really like. That's that's a very creative process, and I enjoy that quite a bit. Do any of those end up in the final piece, or do they usually have to be messed with a little bit to fit with the edit? Yeah, usually there are ideas, like themes, thematic uh, ideas, and then then of course uh, it has to be written to film using the extracting from those ideas and uh, scoring it to picture and it once it's logged. So another question then: Has there ever? I'm gonna start with an example here. Uh, have you seen the Star Wars movies or at least the prequel films? Yeah. All right. Uh -huh. So everybody knows John Williams' music for Star Wars, but during the Phantom Menace, there's the pod race and. Almost that entire pod race, which is one of the most iconic parts of that movie and had like more toys and video games than a lot of other parts of Star Wars, which is saying something. For most of that pod race, there is no music. It's just the sound design and sound mixing, pretty much. There's like one or two little moments where John Williams lets you know, like, hey, something really bad is happening and ah, now it works, you know. <laughs> but for the most part, there's not a lot of music in it. Do you ever um, consider when to not have music in a film? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so this the process called the spotting, which is where a composer and filmmaker will sit together in the beginning of the process of composition and decide where exactly the music goes and doesn't. That's where uh, we create this thing called the spotting or the cue sheet, where we list down every single scene that needs to have music and the start time and the end time of each scene. And that's how the spotting is done. And that's that's basically the blueprint of the whole score and where all in the movie it goes and where it doesn't. And then, of course, there are times when you decide that these are all the scenes that need music. And when the scoring process starts, you go in and decide that oh this scene actually may not need music because many times i'll tell the director that look this scene is great on it by itself and it's it's probably it's doing everything and doesn't need any additional 
you know music or any, any anything else so uh, i'll tell them that maybe let's not have music here or there will be scenes where it seems a little empty that we didn't see in the beginning and decide to put music where we initially decided not to so uh, it's very important i think silence where to use silence effectively is very important because it's it can be easy to fill a film with music and then that's that's definitely not a good artistic choice. Do you have a favorite film score yourself? That's that's always a hard question because there are so many different films that I keep watching and then I'm amazed by the score and then uh, I get amazed by different scores of different movies as I watch them and I have a lot of different scores that I find really amazing. I don't know if there's a favorite, but I feel like How to Train Your Dragon is one of my favorite scores, if not the favorite. I have a score right here on the music stand behind me. Ah, nice. It's a published score that I'm studying right now because it's absolutely one of my favorite scores. It's the second the second How to Train Your Dragon, which I really love uh, as a movie and also the score is just I keep going back to it, listening to it, studying it, and getting just fascinated by it all the time. I enjoy the second How you, to Train Your Dragon immensely. Uh, I yeah. think it's a great sequel. I think as far as animated films and even animated sequels go, uh, mm-hmm. it's pretty underrated. Obviously, the series isn't underrated. Everybody knows right. about How to Train Your Dragon, but I yeah. really, really enjoyed the second one. I remember the first time I saw it, it felt like mm-hmm. such a great natural progression and growth for the characters, and they introduced some new ones, you know, without making it feel like you didn't get to spend time with the characters. I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. So what a cool choice. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Let's see then. So with that in mind, though, a lot of filmmakers have their favorite scores or whatever. uh, And I, I can speak from experience that sometimes that can lead to a habit of using temp music Mm -hmm. that um, eventually I'm at, at the current stage of my artistic growth. I don't use temp music anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. I say anymore, but maybe I'll find a reason to use it again. (laughs) Um, But uh, people listening who might not know what I mean by temp music, temp music is temporary music that often a filmmaker will put in sometimes the rough cut of the edit. So they might literally put the Star Wars score in their scene, but that can lead to them editing based on that music and they'll get really enamored with that score and then they'll take it to a composer and basically say hey do that um and without you know plagiarism (laughs) involved uh do you ever run into temp music and if so how do you feel about it as a composer temp music that's a conversation to be had like that's a that's composers and temp music that's like a age-old conversation and uh it's a love hate thing, you know, and it's is it's lovely if a filmmaker draws inspiration from it and lets you do something of your own and 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 sort of when the temp music is there as a guide, then it's great, but then when temp music becomes something which is like, oh, I want it as you very rightly said, uh, do this without plagiarism that's when it gets painful because then I've had projects where I worked on the project that I worked on where the filmmaker was like, Oh, that little guitar plug here, uh, that's not present in your score. So I would like that. So like that kind of detail. And I'm, I'm like, okay, that that's, that's a little intense in terms of how close you want me to get to the score. And then there are other times when, there is temp music and the filmmaker doesn't almost care. It's just a placeholder. And uh, it's just to say that something is here. You can just go ahead and make the right music that you think is right for this scene. And those are great. Uh, uh, I mean, I feel good about that many times because then I don't have to worry about the temp music at all. And I can do what I need and what I feel creatively is good for the film. And then there is something in between where there are certain uh, elements of this temp score that the filmmakers really like. And 
it's my job to again communicate with them have a conversation about what they like about it sometimes it's the tempo so it's the edit uh, they have edited to that music so it's the tempo sometimes it's the feel sometimes it's the instrument so it's my job to sort of investigate what about the temp score it is that they really like and then decode that and bring that to the table. There was one time I was working with a composer on a short film and I had made like in advance before I even reached out to them, I was like, oh wait, yeah, like I'd gotten on the kick of don't use temp music and I had been determined the entire time don't reference other scores when directing the film, you know, directing the composer. So I didn't want to be like, okay, I want this to be a little bit of Danny Elfman, a little bit of John Williams, a little bit, of, you know, uh, Hans Zimmer, blah, whatever. But um, <laughs> I, I got through almost the entire film without that. Uh, but then there was just this one moment where I really wanted this. It was like, you know, it, it was also like almost like the biggest moment of <laughs> the whole film. Uh, but I really want this big, powerful strike of everything we had heard so far. And uh, they had given me like two versions of it. I hate sending something back like a second or third time, you know, like that's just no one wants that. Um, and I hadn't done that the whole time. They were awesome for everything. And then at some point they asked me, they said, can you just tell like, Give me an example of what you want. Right. <laughs> you know? And uh, I was like, okay, so uh, prelude Tristan and Isolde about this many seconds in, you know, Wagner. And I sent that and they're like, oh, I get it. And they, and it worked. So I was like, all right, Great. well, that's, that was my lesson for sometimes, you know, yes. sometimes if it works, it works. Um but that being said, so you, it's difficult to pick a favorite score, but you settled with How to Train Your Dragon 2. So now yeah. it's the one that at least you're really focused on at the moment. Do you have a favorite film composer yourself? Uh, again, same same problem. I, I, I don't have favorite film composers as much as I have favorite scores. Mm. So because it's the music that matters. Who wrote it may not matter that much. Uh, because all composers write amazing scores and all composers write scores that are not their best work. And so it's always, for me, better to go with favorite scores and the scores that I really enjoy. But John Powell is really one of my, the composer for How to Train Your Dragon. Uh, he, his music is something else. It's, it's very magical and stands out to me. And uh, I think... Again, I, I, I hesitate to say favorite composer, but yeah, I guess. But John he's Powell the one that there. you're looking at the most yeah. right now. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I understand that. It's I know it's a, it seems like a simple question, but of course it's tough, you know. Yeah. It's uh um and even when you do like settle on like, oh, this person, you know, you want to give a bunch of reasons or disclaimers why uh in general, like if I say um my favorite Filmmaker is Peter Jackson, but uh, he didn't make my favorite movie. You know, <laughs> you know right. stuff like that. And like I say, yeah. why, like how his work ethic on his first film, Bad Taste, really inspired me a whole lot. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, that sort of was like my model for starting with like, okay, if I do this, uh, it'll probably work out. <laughs> you know, unless right. I'm just awful. Now working with filmmakers again. There's some scenes in some movies that seem to just flat out not work without music, but the music was composed after that scene was shot and edited. Do you ever experience a filmmaker who makes a scene and presents that scene to you almost like with music in mind? No, I don't mean like they came up with the temp, they got married to the temp music in the edit. I mean like on the day of, they had in mind, I'm going to fill this out with music and it's mm. not going to be necessarily very hyper real or naturalistic in that it, it could work without music, but they have that in mind on the day of shooting because I've seen some things that make me think that has to be the case, but I don't think I've ever heard a director like actually say that's what they were thinking while they were filming something. Have you? I'm not sure if... 
that's the case while they were filming, but there is definitely scenes where the director has in mind the music, the music's role to make the scene complete. And oftentimes, I mean, it, it's not because the scene is bad or anything. A lot of Star Wars take out the music and it just looks funny. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, there are films where music is such a huge part of the film where the director envisions music to be a part of the whole com- complete puzzle. So that has happened for sure. And many times happens, especially with trailers. Trailers are the funniest. Uh, I mean, I say funniest because trailers look very different without music. And because because of the fast cuts and all the different things. It, it's, it's unnatural to look at a trailer without music. And the trailer music is the it's the most intense almost like the biggest sound and the most fast paced and many times of course there are different types of trailers but like all these big action trailers Mm -hmm. uh, they have very intense music so but even with films there are scenes where the director has envisioned music as a part of the completion of that scene so there's even some trailers that will have a song that will be on oh, yeah. the soundtrack maybe for the movie, but actually doesn't even appear in the film. Right. Uh, which I always thought was kind of interesting whenever that happened. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about here is just gets down to communication. Mm-hmm. In the end, temp music is uh, an attempt for a filmmaker to communicate with a composer. Because a lot of filmmakers, frankly, don't know a whole lot about music composition. They might have listened to a lot of John Williams, you know, or Back to the Future, or whatever. But that's sort of like being in the passenger seat of a car and thinking that you know how to drive, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, red means stop and green means go. But when it starts raining, you don't know where the wipers are. So <laughs> um, the have you ever worked with a filmmaker who maybe even started out as a uh, music composer or like had a, a like are have you had have you worked with different filmmakers who had different levels of knowledge and expertise with music yes yes definitely the, there are filmmakers who are very interested in music and take active interest in music uh, they have good musical taste and they are really avid music listeners and uh, appreciators and then there are people who think of music as just another part of the whole filmmaking process like costumes and makeup and music it's I mean of course I'm not trying to create a hierarchy of what's more important or anything I'm just saying that just music is a part of everything else and some filmmakers treat it as such and others are really interested in music as a independent thing. So I have worked with filmmakers of on both extremes and uh, I don't know if one is better or worse, but yeah. Filmmakers who do have expertise and more experience with music composition, have you found in your experience that they are easier or more difficult to work with than filmmakers who might be more ignorant of the process? I have never worked with a filmmaker who is an expert in music in terms of really having a technical expertise uh, in music. So I don't know what that feels like, but I imagine may or may not be fun depending on how intrusive that process becomes because the more you know about something, the more you tend to get picky about it so for example if i am in charge of writing music and i hire a composer to write additional music or something like that uh, in the, in that case what happens is since i am the composer i get very nitpicky about things because i know exactly what needs to be done or what i want and so that's obviously depending on the other person, it could be either pleasant or maybe it's like, it, it could be too intrusive. So the more you know, the more nitpicky you have the option to become because you know those things. So 
fortunately or unfortunately, I've never worked with somebody who had a lot of musical knowledge. But uh, I think it, it all boils down to communication. So if a filmmaker knows how to communicate well, then it doesn't matter how well they know music itself. Because if they tell me the kind of story that needs to be told, the kind of emotions that need to come out, the pacing, things like that, that's enough. That's all I need. And then it doesn't matter if they love Mahler or, uh, you know, whatever else. Like, it, it, it doesn't matter what their musical taste is or how, how well-versed they are with music. That kind of answers another question that I'll want to get into in a second, which is, like, how can filmmakers best communicate <laughs> with you mm. um, and all that. So, But one of the other things that came up, um, let me see if I can grasp this thought before it flies away. Um, like sometimes with uh, the idea of working with a filmmaker who has an expertise in music, I could see how that could be difficult in some ways. Just like not that great actors can't be great directors. Mm. Many have been. But sometimes there will be uh, one interesting example with um, John Wayne's um, telling of the Alamo. There's a scene with an actor, and you he John Wayne's directing the film, right? And there's a lot of really great performances throughout it, but there's a couple of the smaller actors who you can kind of see if you know John Wayne movies sort of are acting a bit like John Wayne, <laughs> and it's because he was telling them how to act and mm. he was taught how to act by John Ford. And, <laughs> you know, so there's like little mannerisms, like this guy like throws a thing down and like, mm. is that John Wayne? <laughs> you know, so right. having a composer, but even then on the other hand, you see some actors who will, uh, and not that John Wayne uh, directed that film poorly or anything. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but, uh, sometimes you'll have actors who will direct and it's an interesting bit of restraint for them to direct and not control the actors because right. they know what they're doing. And, you know, um, so that's uh, I could see how that would easily apply to music or any other aspect of filmmaking. Uh, there are also like actors who direct a movie in which they star as well, where they they are they, they're directing themselves as well. And I. I've always been curious what that looks like. I don't know if you, I'm, I'm sure you have some insight into that, but that's always something that I've wondered about, uh, directing a movie that you are in. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I, most people that I've talked to or listened to, who like whether it's an interview or people who I know personally, find it to be especially exhausting. For me personally, even if it's just, you know, like short video films, whatever or something, I find it almost impossible personally to do. Mm. Not not that it like can't get done, but it's very difficult for me to know what I'm doing if I'm performing on screen, mm. if I'm also directing. Uh, right. If I'm just acting, then I'm very like aware of what I'm doing. Um but for some reason, there's just this disconnect. If I'm directing and I'm in it, uh, it's very, um, you know, maybe it's a skill I could develop if I cared to. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's a pretty tricky thing to figure out for me personally. Um, mm. And I think that a lot of actors uh, experience that kind of thing, which is one reason why the director's there, to let you know how you're doing. You know? right. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, but when I, if I'm directing, and because I do a lot of videos here in the studio where it's just me on camera, right? Mm. And I kind of know how to, like, settle into the right energy that I'm supposed to do. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I watch the playback on it, and I realize, oh, I look totally dead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I need to go more than I think I need to. Um, but it's like while I'm doing it, it's very hard for me to discern of course what we're like how it looks um, how it looks yeah. yeah versus if I'm just acting that's one thing or if I'm just directing yeah. I'm really tuned into it mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so that's uh, its enough. own I know I'm not alone in that but I'm sure that there different people have different experiences with it yeah. um but yeah so okay moving right along here uh you mentioned before just some tidbits of how filmmakers can best communicate with you, like talking about the pacing, uh, 
the emotions involved. Um, is there uh, what what are some other ways <laughs> that some film that filmmakers can express their vision to you? I feel like more than filmmakers, I think it's the composer's job to ha- make that communication happen where I have now developed sort of like a root, not a routine, but a certain things that I do when I get on a film, which is asking questions to filmmakers, sitting with them, having a cup of coffee, talking about things which are not film related, getting to know them personally, getting to know their musical tastes, getting to know what kind of a person they are, because I think that invariably leads into the process, artistic process. So getting to know the people you're working with, of course, you don't always have the luxury to do that, but I, I try my best to have a communication which are outside of that filmmaking process and really getting to know them, develop a relationship, because once you develop a relationship, it's easier to understand how a person communicates. So I think before delving right into the process of composing music, if we just talk to each other and figure out how the other person communicates in general, like how they express themselves uh, and things like that, little things that come up in conversation, that that tells you a lot. And then, so I try to do that and then asking little questions um, about the music they like, if they were listening to some music when they were writing the script or while they were directing or while they were editing and kind of like solving a mystery, almost like getting clues on what their internal process is like. And then of course the spotting, the technical process comes in where you sit and ask the actual questions like what what this scene should do uh, what's the next scene how this progress how's the progression supposed to be and then more technical things like do you want it to sound grand or do you want do do you want us to go small like and thing so so it's 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 more from the composer's side the more questions you ask the filmmaker because filmmakers i feel like they are handling so much they are looking after the whole big production So they are looking at color and music is one part of it, but there are so many other things. So I feel like it should be composer's job to sort of really dig deep into the process and get to know everything. So you take more of a proactive initiative approach with these things, which I think uh, with the explanation you gave of just the filmmakers going in a million different directions and all that really... Uh, you know, justifies that, you know, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, And also the idea of like just spending more time with the person. Some people yeah. might think, ah, is that really ne- necessary? But I can totally see how that would just really uh, facilitate your intuition to be yeah. able to guess what they want. Because uh, right. there's some things that you can glean from those things that they tell you that they don't even realize that they're uh, mm-hmm. revealing to you, yeah. I would bet. As someone who loves music, like when they're just, you know, talking about what they're into, there's stuff that you're able to, you know, almost like Sherlock Holmes, just kind of pick out and understand, <laughs> oh, that means they're going to like this, they're going to like this, they're not really into that style, all that kind of things. Um and uh, so that's that's really fantastic. That being said, have you ever worked with a filmmaker who had just did not have any clue what they wanted whatsoever? Yes, a couple. What's that like? <laughs> uh, it's it's interesting. It's frustrating sometimes because it's uh, it's it's very hard but i don't it's it's funny because in recent i i don't remember in at least the past couple of years it it probably happened in the beginning of my career where i worked with maybe student filmmakers who didn't really and of course 
nobody knows at that point. I mean, not nobody. So that would be their. Would that be their first time working with a composer? That that's true. Yeah. Mm. That also. Yeah. Uh, many of them are working for the first time. Sometimes first time filmmakers who are extremely talented and are making great stuff. And of course, they want since it's their first film. Uh, it's uh, they, they want every little detail to be perfect and to a fault sometimes so <laughs> but yeah that that's all of us right i mean we want especially if it's the first thing that you're putting out in the world we want it to there is a there is certain responsibility we feel uh towards the project and stuff like that so but again as i said like in the last couple of years i have not really worked with anybody who just had no idea what they were doing or that it's, it's been i've been very fortunate to be working i've worked with like some really amazing amazing filmmakers right because on a, a lot of the conversation is sort of um steered toward like working with filmmakers who don't know what they're doing but that is not by any means the uh exclusive experiences that you've had <laughs> um <laughs> like you've uh like i said project going to south by southwest congratulations i know it was a while ago but still thank you you know good for you man (laughs) (laughs) and um, it was it was a a fun project did you get to go to the festival no i unfortunately didn't at Ah. that time but it would have been it would have been amazing i'm sure and then you've had projects that have gone uh on to be on netflix amazon um they've been picked up by pbs as well right which uh i've known a couple people who work with pbs and uh it's uh, it's pretty interesting and you know to like it's it's really cool that you got uh into that flow there which is great um and uh but yeah like the uh you you've worked with the more experienced people who know what they're doing you're not the first composer they worked with uh is there anything that I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, you probably look the people up a little bit maybe before some things, but uh, is there any sort of clue or hint that you get sometimes that this isn't a filmmaker's first rodeo when they're working with you? Yeah, generally just uh, looking them up, looking at their IMDb and stuff. I, as a composer, you get into the habit of really stalking people, <laughs> not in a in a good way, just like looking at what they – have done before what are the kind of films they have done watching a couple of their stuff if that's available online and things like that so that definitely helps going in to know a little bit about their history i'm the same way uh it's uh i think something that i got from my dad um and we'd talk about captain kirk or something i'd be like yeah captain kirk would know everything about someone before he got in a fight with them so <laughs> do that in your professional life. I don't know. (laughs) It's just one of those things. It's a good practice to have either way. Um, uh, So, well, that's fantastic. Well, look, we're getting pretty close um, to our time here, but I want to turn this sort of back to you uh, because even though I did some of my research on you and all that stuff, I'm more than happy to be surprised. And I just wanted to ask you if there's anything exciting that you've got going on right now that you're just itching to tell people about. Well, lots of exciting things. Uh, One of the things that recently happened, which was such a incredible, such an incredible thing to have experienced, which was we did like a little thing last year, Sound and Music for, and it got an Emmy award. This uh, right, just right now. Nice. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, that that was that was pretty cool to know too. I wanted to go to New York. It was a New York chapter Emmy, so uh, the filmmakers ended up going to New York. I was debating whether to go. I wanted, I really wanted to go, mm-hmm. but I couldn't at this time. But flights yeah. are expensive right now. It's yeah, yeah, everything, and also it's it's a very busy month right now. So, uh, but yeah, that happened. We are uh, our, my team is working a lot on animation, so we are doing a lot of animation projects which is very exciting and uh october is filled with lots of different events that i'm going to there is lightbox expo that's happening this weekend there is uh the american french film festival that i'm headed to after this and that's happening for the rest of the week and there is a game sound conference happening later in the month and then 
beginning of November, there is AFI Film Festival that I want to attend. So lots of festivals and events lined up in LA that I'm very excited to go to and network. And of course, uh, while all of that is happening, we are constantly working on documentaries, animations, commercials, things like that. A lot of projects, exciting projects are coming up. Uh, nothing that I can think of, which is all of all of the projects are really, really fantastic. So of course, we keep updating our website and stuff and I keep uh, putting out stuff on social media and whatnot when it comes out but yeah uh, all over it's uh it's a great time as you said as you i think you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast uh great year for film things are going well for you you're getting more work uh you're getting that encouragement by getting that work recognized which has got to feel great you know and uh so uh i i've really I don't want to wrap this up, <laughs> but this has been a great conversation. Thanks a lot for being on. Um, and I, I mean, I've learned some stuff, you know, I'm sure any of our listeners have as well. It's been a really good conversation. Uh, if you want to come on again sometime, if you got something to promote, just let me know. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, thanks a lot for coming on. I really enjoyed this a lot. Thank you so much for having me. It was a fantastic conversation. It was nice to talk about all the things that I usually have on the back of my mind, but it, it was nice to articulate a lot of these things. Well, thank you very much. It was uh, great to talk with you about them. Thank you very much. Cheers. Take care. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you want to start your own podcast, why wait? Reach out to us at studioMe.me, and I hope you hear me again soon.